Today we're talking about Egypt, a country that owes so much money even grad students are saying, phew, at least we're not them. It sounds like, dare I say it, a pyramid scheme. Despite all this, Egypt has become a hotspot for investment and their economy is booming by every metric. Well, except for the general well-being of Egyptians. Today I want to look at the detrimental economics of large government debt and the domestic politics that come into play when you take money from the geopolitical payday loan institution that is the IMF. So let's start this story from the last time any American cared about Egyptian politics. This week in 2011, millions of Egyptians took to the streets to demand the resignation of President Mubarak after nearly 30 years of authoritarian rule. It was 2011 and the Arab Spring was spreading democracies across northern Africa. Now I'd go into more detail on this government except that it had the lifespan of a sick fruit fly. In 2013, the army led by Abd al Fattah al Sisi staged a coup. This is the guy we're dealing with today. To be fair, Egypt had elections since this coup, but we'll just put it this way he wins with about the same margin as Kim Jong un does. So do with that what you will. Anyways, enter new Egyptian president and man who definitely wears his sunglasses at night, Abdel Fattah el Sisi. Now back in 2014, Sisi is facing a pretty major problem. A revolution in 2011 and a coup two years later tipped Egypt into an economic crisis. Investors and tourists fled, growth was anemic, and unemployment peaked at 13.2%. Yeah, it's never a good sign for investors when your country is going through leaders faster than if it was actually a democracy. So what do you do? Quick hint, this is a chart of the Egyptian foreign debt. And this is the point at time where Sisi was trying to figure out what his next step was. Oh boy, the only restraint this administration is comfortable with is restraining the opposition leaders. So what happened? Well, Finance Minister Hamed Galal made the decision to undertake a Keynesian type of fiscal stimulus to increase production and consumption. Fortunately for Egypt, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates each offered the equivalent of nearly 4 billion euros. That's a big boost to President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi who is reforming the economy after years of political upheaval. 12 billion dollars from your old pals in the Gulf. That was enough to pay for two stimulus packages totaling about $8.5 designed to help pay public employees more, build some infrastructure like roads and metro lines, restructure factories, and revamp some state owned enterprises. You know, all that incredibly dull stuff that's responsible and super boring. Oh yeah, and… It's a new capital city carved out of the desert and directly in line with President Sisi's new economic vision for Egypt. Wait, what? Yeah, this is where you start to see something weird happen. How can a guy who literally suggested funding development projects via collecting spare change at the same time be struggling with the problem of Sisi's grand new city is running out of money. The project has various budget estimates, all outlandish and totaling $50 billion or more. I mean, I have to tell you, without context, this feels like lending a thousand bucks to help your friend make rent and finding out he bought a ticket on Elon Musk's next space launch. This is where we get the idea of two totally different and completely unconnected economies in Egypt. For this next part, I'm going to have to tell you a tale of two cities, New Cairo and Old Cairo. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You see, Sisi's dream has been, taking their cues from recent building sprees in China and Gulf states, Sisi's mega projects are meant to attract foreign investment, buttress his grand ambition of providing jobs and reviving the economy and keep the rest of the regime happy since Egypt's military is basically building everything. Ok, where is that money coming from? Because either you guys found a ton of spare change or there's something else going on here. Well, this brings us to 2016. Can we bring up the debt tracker one more time? We're headed to this point. 
No, you bet something intense is about to happen. Egypt is getting a massive cash injection from the International Monetary Fund. A phase $12 billion loan has been approved to support Cairo's economic reform program. Egypt has been finding it tough to attract dollars and revive its economy since the uprising back in 2011. Okay, this raises some questions like, so what? And okay, great, they got a $12 billion loan. Well, one does not simply qualify for an IMF loan. The IMF is what would happen if you took the consciousness of Ronald Reagan and uploaded it into a corporation. Again, it's 2016 right now and Gulf economies are shrinking because of a decline in oil revenue. So that source of aid is ending. At this point, analysts were correctly predicting it looks like Egypt may have to return to the negotiating table with the International Monetary Fund which will have a very different reform agenda than its Arab Gulf state allies. Boy, did that turn out to be an understatement. Egypt's leadership was more than happy to play along for the loans though. Sisi's government has followed what one executive admiringly calls almost a caricature of IMF program. So what were those changes? Egypt's economic revival plan includes cutting electricity subsidies and curbing wage increases. The central bank is also expected to devalue the local pound to end an ongoing dollar crunch that's been hampering economic activity. Now that might not sound like much, but who boy did we take a hard turn from Keynesian stimulation economics into hardcore austerity. Investors definitely noticed this. A budget deficit that hit 12.5% of GDP in 2015 to 2016 has fallen. Next year it's expected to be a manageable 7.5%. So this raises the obvious question, if the government is cutting spending and maintaining their revenue, where is all of this debt coming from? Remember, this is a tale of two cities, New Cairo and Old Cairo. While the government was making severe cuts to their budget, military institutions have taken aid from Gulf countries and borrowed heavily from foreign institutions to expand their commercial footprint. This includes massive investments in non-productive mega-projects, the most notable of which are a new Suez Canal which cost $8 billion to construct and the new administrative capital which is expected to cost $300 billion. Yeah, the estimates on what that capital projects cost vary pretty wildly. Guess it's hard to price how much it costs to build a new city out in the middle of the desert. Anyways, a lot of this debt is coming from… The government says Chinese future investments are expected to exceed $20 billion in the new capital alone. China's growing economic presence has given a boost to Egypt's reforms in the last few years. Again, what? During this period, the World Bank, an institution that is currently supportive of these reforms, wrote, Some 60% of Egypt's population is either poor or vulnerable, and inequality is on the rise. So how could they be supportive of this? Well, unemployment has fallen recognizably since the austerity and debt programs came in. It had been a huge problem since the first democratic revolution. Wow, that is a sheer cliff and seems to have returned to that low, low rate of 8%. Of course, most of these jobs are in the construction sector, because if you're going to spend tens of billions of dollars building a new capital in the desert, widening the Suez Canal, and other projects, well, you need someone to lift the bricks. Fortunately, these jobs are concentrated on the youth, a demographic that has suffered disproportionate unemployment rates. CC will also point to Egypt's GDP growth, which has gone from a low of just over 2% to just over 5%. Again though, if Trump were to borrow a ton of money and build a second New York in the Mojave Desert, I'm sure that would temporarily shift the needle. So these policies are helping some people. Really getting to see the engines of growth on the move is always really exciting and certainly as I've said before, you know, here in Egypt after years of a sluggish growth and worries about the economy, mm. I'm finally starting to see those wheels beginning to turn. The concern at this point is, the jobs these projects create don't last for long, while they burden the government with debt which it struggles to pay off. And this is where things get interesting. 
because while I was held back a little by my complete lack of Arab fluency, Google Translate can only get you so far on the Egyptian Federal Reserve's website, I did find a source that talked about the major debt numbers. This next excerpt comes from Foreign Policy Magazine and is insane. The government currently allocates 38% of its entire budget merely to pay off interest on its outstanding debt. That means that almost 40% of their federal budget is going towards not paying down the debt, just making interest payments so the debt doesn't get bigger. When you get to the agreed upon installment plans to actually reduce the debt, add loans and other things, this is more than 58% of the budget that's eaten up. Almost 60% of your budget is dedicated to paying down your debt. Oh man, at this point I think CC might rig the next election so he loses. 97% of the country wrote in for Mickey Mouse. According to the central bank, Cairo needs around $25 billion a year for debt installments alone. The government has covered this amount by borrowing on long-term repayment plans. Oh man, I'll take government plans that are not going to work out well for 300, Alex. Now some Egyptians are angry because these measures could have included privatizing military and government-owned enterprises and imposing taxes on their profits, investing more in the education system to raise the quality of the labor force implementing progressive taxation and raising the minimum wage to stimulate local demand, but we're building a city in the middle of the desert instead. There is one final piece to the puzzle. Why are so many people excited to give Egypt money? They're taking out loans to pay for previous loans. Not joking this time, that reeks of a pyramid scheme. But this all comes down to the value of the Egyptian pound. Remember how the IMF said, in order to get the loan... Freeing up the Egyptian pound was part of a deal with the International Monetary Fund. It's now more likely to give Egypt around 12 billion dollars. Basically, for quite some time, Egypt was doing things to make their dollar appear stronger than it really was. Without getting too complicated, the central bank was essentially saying this dollar? Well, it's actually worth two dollars. Now you don't want to do business with someone trying to keep their currency artificially strong because when that house of cards comes falling down, it's the people who own the debt that end up footing the bill. Let's just say I do a deal where I give you 100 Egyptian pounds now and you give me 110 Egyptian pounds in a year. I'd be screwed if you have an epiphany where you say, you know what, the pound is worth a pound, not two pounds. I'm not doing this policy anymore. Well, that 110 pounds we agreed on is now worth half of what it was when we shook hands. So before getting the IMF loan, they had to take a good long look in the mirror and say, this pound, it's worth a pound. This immediately led to a cratering in the value of their currency, which geez, sorry Gulf countries that were making loans with them years earlier. It also led to a 30% inflation rate, which destroyed the savings of Egyptians saving money in currency rather than real estate and stocks. And of course, it raised the prices on everything. Although, as Bloomberg reported about the Egyptian economy last week, with the currency strengthening and yields still attractive, foreign holdings of local debt have surged at almost 40% this year through April. Basically, they're paying a high interest rate, willing to make cuts to the budget to keep making payments on loans, and the underlying currency is actually going up in value. Investors chanted, let's build a capital city in the desert, or whatever. Oh man, at this point it feels like Egypt's only option is to send their president to IMF headquarters and have him say, let my people go. Jeez, after this episode, I am definitely banned from Egypt. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, as always, thank you for watching. Now if you enjoyed the subject matter of this video, I'm actually providing a link to one of my favorite books, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, in the description. So if you want to learn more, you can check that out. If you enjoyed this video, remember to give me a thumbs up. Also hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. As always, 
Thank you for watching.